to be talking about American Indian women this morning, and I think you're going to find it very fascinating in how much we really owe to the Indians that unfortunately we have treated so poorly. But we have Jane Curtis here in the studio. She's going to bring us some interesting facts. So what do we have? Good morning. Well, uh, we have a lot of perhaps surprising things to learn this morning okay. when we focus on North American Indian women. And let me say, first of all, I think some people are might be offended by the use of the word Indian. But some years back, I actually spoke. I had lunch one time at a Smithsonian thing, and there were two American Indians present, which you wouldn't have known. I mean, yeah. they looked just like the rest of us and were dressed just like the rest of us. Right. But the qu question came up, and they said rather quietly, we would just as soon be called Indians. Indians. So, uh, and, and they think they're, they're not, not the first and you know, so on and so on. But so with, with that out of the way, uh, we're talking about the, primarily the women in a, in a particular uh, time span and, uh, well, place and time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it happens to focus directly on the uh, period of the Revolutionary War. Okay. And somewhat before and a little bit after. And I thought that this time, perhaps instead of working in some good uh, quotations and things, we will start with some very interesting things that might surprise us right off the bat. Okay. And then from there we'll branch out into some of the other facts, mention some of the people by name and give them the, their histories a little bit as we know them. Um, first quotation I would like to read uh, is going to be uh, from a letter written by a Cherokee woman to Benjamin Franklin. Okay. The Cherokee were a large tribe and they went down clear to Georgia and there are a lot of Cherokees still in, in Virginia. In fact, I've known a couple of them. Right. Um, but the, um, uh, she, she wrote to him in 1787, a fateful year, also like so many of those in the that period, um, advocating peace between the new United States and the Cherokee Nation. Uh, now, a lot of blood had already been shed, right. principally in the New York, Pennsylvania, uh, Ontario, Canada area there where there was a lot of action mm -hmm. and there were a lot of colonists and the mix wasn't doing too well. Um, she advised Franklin that political leaders ought to mind what a woman says and look upon her as a mother. And I have taken the privilege to speak to you as my own children, and this is her English, and I am in hopes that you have a beloved woman amongst you who will help to put her children right if they do wrong, as I shall do the same. Now, beloved woman, she's not just saying she hopes that, that these men on the other side are happily married or something right. like that. But that was a particular category of woman. And in these tribes, in the tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy, which we'll talk about a little more, um, women held uh, an excellent and respected position. Yes. In fact, they in were many ways. Highly respected. In many ways, the coin was turned over from the present day because the women did it all, really. Uh, the men's job was to hunt and fish and fight whenever fighting occurred. And of course, the women were trying to see that it didn't occur. Right. And when this confederacy had been f formed, and the dates on that uh, vary, but it, several, at least several hundred years before the Europeans came, this confederacy of, of certain tribes existed. Right. And the founders were, were uh, one man, one woman, and Hiawatha also had words to say in there, mm -hmm. Tuscarora Indian. Okay. But when, when, this, when she says, uh, in hopes that you have a beloved woman, uh, she means that in her, in her society there, um, women did the negotiating, they did the administering, they knew all about the place. Uh, they, they were, the, the men were, were the kind of the, the front, the show. Mm -hmm. They were out there doing these active things that had to be done, much as with the Mongol tribes that yeah. I mentioned. But the women were the ones who knew what was going on. And she was 
assuming that the men that they were dealing with would take this back to their women's to their women. councils yeah. and that they would proceed from there. Mm -hmm. um, now the men, of course, then when the white men appeared, they weren't about to deal with women. They insisted upon dealing with men. Isn't it interesting how our societies expect another society to operate the same way ours does? It's not only interesting, it was, it was lethal, it was, it was fatal it, yes, for definitely. the other one yes. because force went with this male dominant thing, right. greater force than the Indians had. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one that shows you that this, this woman not only, uh, these women not only were, uh, had a voice within their own tribe and with their own confederacy, but that they also would address outside public figures, uh, much in a motherly way. Right. My children are dealing with you, and you know, we will, we want peace. The other thing here came somewhat later in the relationship, um, when the U.S. was pressuring the Cherokees to give up their land and move west. Mm -hmm. And that pressure began pretty early. It began, the weight began to swing in the colonists' favor. Uh, but when they were pressuring was going on at any rate, groups of Cherokee women petitioned their council, see they're doing this through channels, um, to stand their ground in negotiations and reminding them as their beloved children, now here they, they are the be beloved women, mm -hmm. and so this is a parallel, as their beloved children, so they're speaking to their beloved children, um, they're reminding them that, that they themselves had raised these council members on that land which God gave us to inhabit and cultivate and admonishing them not to, quote, part with any more lands. Right. And this is going to come up and we've had particular advocates that, for that amongst the Indian women. Um, we will say a little word here, I think, about the Iroquois Confederacy, and if we could please see a first picture. The Iroquois Confederacy, Confederacy, as I mentioned, had existed for at least a few hundred years, and as of this time in history, there were five and later six tribes, and you'll recognize these names because they all crop up in present-day American towns and areas. The one on the far right is Tuscarora, and they were the last of the tribes to join in with it. Uh, the others, uh, I don't know if you can read on there, but we have the, uh, see, I'm not sure which is in which place there. I guess it's the Seneca, uh, the, the four of them in any way, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Seneca, the Mohawk, and, and then the, later on the Tuscarora. Uh, now the, these tribes were powerful, they fought with each other. There were a lot of attempts to get around that. Um, the, the name itself, uh, let's see, the name in, in Indian is uh, Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee. For, uh, the Iroquois were not a tribe, they were a confederation. Uh, and they were, that meant people of the long houses. Right. So they, they didn't build uh, uh, teepees and uh, other lodges like the people in the West, like the Indians in the West. But th they were characterized by these long houses and we may see a picture of them later, but they were, they were very long, they were regular shelter, they're beautifully built, and who, who built them, who constructed, who, the who oversaw the building, the women uh, did that. Uh, the women uh, also were, were uh, the, the record keepers, as were men. The women were medicine women, as were men. And, and medicine wasn't only for healing, although the women were the only ones, who, uh, they were the farmers, they did the agriculture. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones then who, who determined, well, who, who grew the herbs, who knew what to do with the herbs, who, who healed mm -hmm. uh, and were, were highly regarded. They were also highly regarded. The Indians, I think perhaps all over and perhaps a little still today had a, a more of a spiritual cast and I don't mean like our religion, which was pretty cut and dried, mm -hmm. but the great spirit concept and that nature was sort of their, their God, mm -hmm. which didn't mean that they were nasty to each other because uh, 
they were just like all people, mm -hmm. but they also hungered for peace and they also had a great respect for the land and the spirit, the spirit of the people that mm -hmm. dwelt on the land, right. which was another thing that made it so important to these women as the particular keepers of the spirit to say, don't give away our land, don't right. sell our right. land for a mess of pottage, right. as, as right. it were, as in the biblical. But th this meant that when the um, uh, people started, the scholars started getting into it and looking, they, they were all men, mainly men. Certainly in the past centuries they were men. Whom were they consulting? What sources were they consulting? Men, only men. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this got buried. But meanwhile the women, of course, continued to do their thing. Right. Uh, so you know, I wanted to uh, go to another thing here. This is from, from an Oneida. We had two, two, two examples from the Cherokee Indians. This is from the Oneida. Oneida was one of the two tribes that went for the colonists in the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. You might recall when we talked about Washington yes. at Valley Forge. The Oneida helped with, strike together some food here and there when, when mm -hmm. they could. But now here, when they got to negotiating, and a couple of the women did get into negotiating, thank goodness, as one chief tried to explain to the white and they say diplomats here, to the white people who diplomat, uh, to were negotiating, it was always the custom for women to be present at councils, being of much esteem among us, men are saying this, in that we proceed from them. I mean, they bring us into being. Right. And they provide our warriors with provisions when they go abroad. And this meant not only food in a little pouch, but I meant the pouch the clothing, sure. the weapons even. And a, even even when they got to using guns later on, one of the women will talk about, uh, I think of her as the bullet biter because she started out with her husband in a fight against another tribe and she would chew the bullets before she handed it to him to put them in the gun. And why was that done? Because they'd be more like what we'd call maybe, well not exactly dumb dumb bullets, but she said they would do more damage. Mm -hmm. If they got into somebody, a hacked up thing hacked of metal bullet, yeah. would do it. Yeah. A smooth bullet wouldn't do anywhere near as much. So they, these, these women were sometimes not missing a trick, but they, the warriors realized it, that, that the women brought them into the world and the women provided them with their clothing and their weapons and their food. And They were really the anchor of the tribe. They were the anchor. Yeah. And again, uh, so you think, well, gosh, they did everything. They couldn't have done everything. But look at the way it flipped over. The men were allowed to do all these different trades, mm -hmm. and the women were no longer allowed to do them. Exactly. Uh, so to, to some extent, it, it flipped over on them. Uh, but now this, um, and now, and uh, much esteem among us in that we proceed from them and they provide a, our warriors with provisions when they go abroad. Now, Sir William Johnson was an Englishman who was was his title, Superintendent of Indian Affairs over there. And even he was, was uh, kind of doubtful about women's role in negotiating. Mm -hmm. And he was married to one of the prominent women in this, oh. in this whole thing. Went by, she went by the name of Molly Brandt, although her name, now this is the one long Indian name that I think I remembered. And it's konwatsitsiayeni, konwatsitsiayeni, and I couldn't find a meaning for it. Most of you can find the meaning, right, right. but the, she had an Indian name. She was raised. Well, we'll get into her a little bit later. Okay. But the um, views of the um, English on Indian society, of course, ranged all the way from just completely uh, nothing. All Indians were just nothing uh, to realizing that they better respect some of these things mm -hmm. and learn from them. You know the stories we learn as children about how friendly Indians in the 1600s taught the settlers how to get a good corn crop and right, all that. Right. Uh, that. That was disappearing. But the, uh, the some of the best things we have uh, were from uh, white women who were captured by Indians. Mm -hmm and spent time with them. And we had, we have uh, the word from at least three that I found. 
and they said they would just as soon have been out raising corn, raising, doing agriculture, or ma making uh, leather clothing or things like that, as sitting somewhere in a, in a, a log cabin and doing nothing but just freezing and you know and having to scrimp and do it, all these things by hand with no one around. Everybody else was out doing something else, mm -hmm. farming and all. She'd rather be doing the farming. So the opinions were you know were were varied. Right. A lot of them, of course, of course, that didn't fare so well. One said she was unhappy because of an Indian warrior, a woman, had captured her and wasn't treating her very well. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, now I want to read another one, another another angle on this situation. Uh, this one I want to read out of the book. I think there are a couple here. Uh, uh, both American and English authorities understood how valuable this particular woman, whose name went by the name of Molly Brand, how very valuable she could be in any negotiating with the Iroquois. Uh, as Lieutenant Colonel Tench. Tilgman, the secretary to the American Indian Commission, crassly put it, women govern the politics of savages. <laughs> a clever man, he added, always kept up a good understanding with the brown ladies. I mean, talk about condescension and, mm -hmm. and arrogance and so on. Um, uh, where were we here? Uh, from the beginning, though, Molly was honored. Uh, Molly was honored. Um, I'm a loyalist. She believed her political commitment to the crown honored her husband's memory. And this was Sir William that we just mentioned as kind of looking down on women's abilities. She was married to Sir William, a British man. And so she, uh, she's serving the best interests of the, her Mohawk kinsmen and kinswomen. Yet, uh, over here on the other side now, we have uh, British officials never underestimated her importance. So the, the Americans tended to, uh, the Indians preferred the British because they thought the British would rule from afar and wouldn't just move in and, and mm. take, right. take over and drive them out. And so while the Americans, the colonists, already being called Americans, were they, they were grabbing the land sure because they were living off of it sure so they tended to favor the British. Um, British officials never underestimated the importance of this lady as a negotiator. An officer at Carlton Island grudgingly conceded that the good behavior of the Indian refugees uh, there there is in a great measure to be ascribed to Miss Molly. There were Indian refugees. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these refugees were Indian women. And they were beginning to teach Americans, particularly American women, if, if, if the connection was good. Uh, and some of it was very good. Some of these Indian women were educated in col uh, colonial schools, right, British right. schools. Um, Sir William Johnson's son-in-law, that's her husband's son-in-law, Daniel Klaus, uh, put it more bluntly. One, Joseph and Mary Brand, her, her brother Joseph was chief of the tribe of the Mohawks. One, Joseph and Mary Brand will outdo 50 British officers <laughs> in managing and keeping the Indians firm. One word from Mary Brand is more taken notice of by the five nations, the Iroquois, than a thousand from the white man, mm -hmm. without exception. So they had some influence, and at, at one time, um, uh, on the foreigners, but it, unfortunately, it didn't. It didn't last. It was. It was overtaken by uh, time and circumstances, and right. as the Americans began to win and the British began to disappear. Um, now, I think we'll just look at a little bit from the other side. Another quote here from George Washington all people. Now, the Indians kept suing for peace, particularly the women. The men were fighting as they had to, and they, and they, but the women really wanted to stop it and stop giving away land. Um, George Washington 
advised extreme cruelty in rooting out the opposition. And this was particularly in this bad period in the late 1770s when in Pennsylvania and New York were just awash in blood. Mm -hmm. the, the settlers were, were trying to uh, massacre Indians as, as the Indians advanced on them. The right. Indians were massacring them. And then the local militia, this was Americans in this case, was coming in and just let them out. Right. Um, so George Washington ordered American forces to carry the war into the heart of the country of the Six Nations, to cut off their settlements, destroy the next year's crop, and do them every other mischief which time and circumstance permit. Uh, so this is this is not not a happy scene. Uh, let's perhaps go on to three individual. Let us look, please, at picture number two. Um, this shows some of their long houses, and this is where the, the women held sway. Uh, they were always, uh, they always looked orderly in every drawing I ever saw of mm -hmm. them, or ruins or anything. Uh, in the next picture, we will see obviously a sketch, but since there are no real pictures of these people, people this is believed to have been taken from uh, contemporary pictures of Molly. Brandt. Um, Molly Brandt was a Mohawk Indian, as we just mentioned. Her brother was the chief of the Mohawks. She was educated in uh, British school, and where she also learned uh, salon manners and you know, how to dress like a white person. Mm -hmm. In other words, she was she became bilingual and bi bicultural, as it were. Mm -hmm. And she uh, married this Sir William. Sir William was a fairly elderly um, widower, and she had a lot of influence through, through him. Uh, she lived in the fan big fancy house that they lived in and had estate there and grounds and, and like a farm, you know, producing what they needed. Uh, it happened to be within areas held mostly by Americans. And she one time uh, warned some of her neighbors that they better get out because the, uh, there was going to be a raid you know, in, in the other territory there. And the Americans knew about it. And uh, they ambushed, or the, the British ambushed the Americans on their way to relieve Washington mm -hmm. and some skirmish going on. So uh, it began to be a little dangerous for her to stay. So she did move into the, the other territory there. But she lasted out the war. Her husband died in 1774. She lasted out the war, helping where she could. And then she uh, withdrew to Canada. The British were giving land grants to people in Canada. Mm -hmm. So she went up there with her family, and there she, there she died. But another woman now is very important. The next picture will show us went by the name of Esther Montour. Uh, Esther Montour, and obviously, again, no pictures of her for real, but this comes from one of the historical sites. And it's a drawing that's believed to have been taken from a drawing at the time. Um, she was a, um, a hot pistol, <laughs> as people sometimes describe. These, these ladies who were so, uh, she was a warrior of no mean accomplishments. She came from a mixed marriage family. And this shows you that initially there was mixing. Right. And on a, you know, on a, a civilized level, it mm -hmm. wasn't just either one going over to the other side. But the originator of that clan was a Frenchman who had come over in the 1600s and married a, a local woman. I've forgotten, I think it was a Seneca. But uh, she was, uh, Esther anyway, it was, it was a Seneca Indian. And the Indians had a very tight policy. Again, like the Mongols, you did not marry anybody in your own tribe. Right. 
You see that with the Navajo and others. Sure. You married in another tribe, and whether they knew or not, the ill effects of too much inbreeding, mm -hmm. that's what they did. So uh, she was a Seneca. She married a general from the Delawares and participated in fighting there. We're beginning to wind down now. Uh -oh. so. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go very quickly then to another, another good example who was uh, one by the name of Nancy Ward, and her Indian name was, was Nanyehi. And Nancy Ward uh, was the bullet biter. Okay. And she was, th th these people were, were uh, pure Indian. They were not mixed the mm -hmm. way uh, Esther might have been a, an unusual example. But Nancy would be the next picture, please, that we have here. And again, taken from drawings, but she was a, a warrior, strong warrior, and she and her husband, her husband, uh, she married somebody with the Indian name Kingfisher, was transcribed as Tsu'a, and they fought together in battles, uh, and then she took over when he was killed. And she, she lived, uh, she, she eventually married uh, another another general uh, from the Tuscaroras, uh, a chief from the Tuscaroras, mm -hmm. and went off there. She lived to a ripe old age, uh, so she okay. was very important. She was an excellent negotiator, and she held out. They held out as long as they could on the giving away of the lands, but the trouble was that the women would brief the men who were going to have to do most of the negotiating, brief the men, oh, don't give the land away. And the men would be offered, you know, some good thing, right, right. and they take it, not realizing. And of course, eventually, they had gone, the yeah. worst happened. Okay, we're into but, the last minute. Yeah, to to um, as, as a, I don't know if we can do a final final summarizing that will include a couple of other things I wanted to mention here. Uh, important concepts here are the uh, the beloved woman. Uh, we might show a, a, a last picture. There's a picture of, uh, this is Mary Jemison, and supposedly taken from a drawing at the, at the time, you know, painted in a crude painting. But she was the one who was captured and said she would rather be out hoeing corn in, in a Seneca field than she would Sit, she was just in a, soon become in a drawing part of room, a Seneca. Yeah. You know, we're running a household all by right. herself with nobody right. around. Right. So, but the the key thing, the key things about it are, I think that the uh, the women were not downtrodden. Right. Uh, the women ran the whole show and were thereby more capable. The men, of course, I guess, were crack hunters and fish. But the women did that too. The women could hunt and the women could sure. fight. Right. So they really did it all, and probably would have gone on being that way say, oh, well, the men just like to lie around and be drunk, but that's not true. No, of course, no. alcohol and disease were things. Right, and that, that the white man to brought them. in to them, yeah. But yeah. I, I just want us to go away with a respect for these women uh, who were uh, so uh, cruelly done in, really. And so I think some are rising to the fore now. You're seeing more right. Indian women doing things, but uh, hey, Come, hey, coming back out. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you a lot, Jane. Mm -hmm.